All right, come on, make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house. Come on. We are ready to receive the word. Amen? Amen. Welcome again to, to Discovery Church. We're in this series called First John. We're basically just studying verse by verse this five-chapter, small book, but powerful and strong book in the New Testament, written by the Apostle John, who's now talking to the second, third generation church about some, uh, some ways that they might be drifting in their faith. And, and throughout the, this series, these last two messages, they're online for you, but we've, we've heard God use the Apostle John in warning the church about some, some conflicts. Last week, it was the conflict between light and darkness, and we talked about how to walk in the light and the lure of, of darkness, and he talks about the conflict of love and hatred, and that's actually threaded throughout the entire uh, letter. But today, he's going to explain this third conflict, the conflict between truth and error. Today's message is called, Walk in the Truth. How do we do that? How do we? John's going to help us walk in the truth because he's going to explain to us it's not enough for us to walk in the light, and it's not enough for us to just walk in love if we're not walking in the truth. Why? John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the the truth and the life. Truth is who God is. It is his nature. It's who he is. In John 8, 32, Jesus says, and then you will know the truth. And it's this truth that actually makes you, what is it? Free. This is this, this, the truth that actually makes us free. So John is, is explaining the importance here uh, that we would know, that we would discern the issue of truth. It's this. The issue of truth is truth or consequences. That's what it is. The Apostle John is going to show us this contrast between the spirit of truth, what he calls the spirit of truth, and the spirit of error. The spirit of, of Christ and the spirit of Antichrist. The, the children of God and the children of the devil in this contrast of truth and error. Let me show you why this truth is so important, why Jesus says it makes you free to help set up this message, not in your notes, but here's why this is so important and what truth is. Yes, truth is what makes you free, but here's why. Truth is actually working from the kingdom of God, meaning this, truth is a commodity and resource of the kingdom of heaven. It exists in heaven. God's truth, he is truth. Truth is working from the kingdom of God, using the revelation of his word through the church by means of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I could preach all that in just one message, you guys. And, I, and, I, and we're getting closer to where I'm explaining more of this to you guys, but I'm just planting seeds, okay? Here's, here's what you need to know to set up this message. Truth is working from heaven, from the kingdom of God, and it uses the revelation of the word of God through the church. Who's the church, by the way? It's us. It's those who are born again, who have been born of the Spirit, who are surrendered to God by means of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But check this out. This is why it's so important that John makes this distinction. Truth matters. The spirit of truth, there's also a spirit of falsehood, a spirit of error. And falsehood is also working, but it's not working from the kingdom. It does not exist or live in the kingdom of God. Falsehood is working from the spiritual realm. The apostle John has called it the spiritual realm of darkness. We studied that last week. Falsehood is working from the spiritual realm using deception and evil through willing vessels, this would be a different type of surrender, not the surrender that comes through the church, but a surrender of agreement through falsehood. A willing spirit. I agree with deception. I agree with falsehood by means of demonic principalities. This is why truth matters. John says, it don't matter. You, can, you can claim to walk in the lie. You can claim to be all about love. But if you're not walking in truth, you will face the consequences. Because you're either walking in truth. Listen to me. You're either walking in truth. You either have the spirit of truth or you have the spirit of falsehood. There is no between spirit. Remember, John is, is a letter of contrast. This is, it's either light or dark. It's not gray. It's love or hate. You either love or you hate. John says you, you're, either, you're either listening to and operating by a spirit of truth, the spirit of Christ, or the spirit of error, the spirit of anti-Christ. Y'all ready? Okay, Let, let's, let's pick it up where we left off in verse 18. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. He says, dear children... This is the last hour when you see that phrase in the New Testament. 
Um, it's not meaning like they thought he would come at any moment, which they did, but this is what that literally means. That last hour is when Jesus actually ascended after his resurrection to the right hand of the Father until he comes back for his bride, the church, that time frame is called the last hour, okay? So we are living in this, la- I'll get, we'll talk about that a little bit more in the message. And as you have heard from, uh, that the Antichrist is coming, and not just the Antichrist that he talks about in Revelation, the person that is the, the manifestation of Satan, but he says, even now, many little Antichrists <laughs> have come. And this is how we know that this is the last hour. In 1 John chapter 4, he kind of explains a little bit more about this contrast of these, the spirit of falsehood and the spirit of Christ. Let me kind of show you because it applies to our message today. 1 John chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. He says this, we are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. They can't. They're spiritually discerned. They cannot understand these spiritual truths. And he says this, by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of our error. Beloved, let us love one another. By this you will know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, love one another. By this, here's how we know, spirit of truth or the spirit of error. Love one another. You see it? Love one another. For love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. See, following God calls us to embrace this love. Following God calls us to embrace forgiveness as a way of life. It is simply anti-Christ to justify unforgiveness, to justify division and selfish ambition. The anti-Christ spirit will be and is disguised in a number, behind a number of issues, but all those issues are just simply tools of this principality used to divide God's people. The spirit of the Antichrist is simply that spirit which is anti-Christ. Listen to me, it's anti-love. The spirit of Antichrist is anti-forgiveness, anti-reconciliation. So the Apostle John gives us another test, and his letter is full of these tests and these contrasts. And another contrast here, we're going to discover today, through John's writings, the three marks of the spirit of the Antichrist. The three marks, the deceptive spirit of falsehood, so we're not led astray, or operating ourselves by the wrong spirit. And that should be up on the screen. Go ahead. Three marks of the spirit of the Antichrist. And we're also going to see the four marks of the child of God. The three marks of the spirit of Antichrist and the four marks of the child of God. How many of y'all ready for the word today? Come on. You ready to study this together? Because we need to be able to discern what spirit that, that's coming at us and we're, we're listening to and looking at. Three marks of the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of falsehood, false teaching. What does it look like? John says, number one, it looks like this. That spirit of Antichrist departs from fellowship. It disconnects from the body. It isolates. It divides. It, it removes. That is, that is the work of this anti-Christ. So you might have, we talked about this a little bit, you might have relationship, but maybe you don't have fellowship. See, you can have relationship. Every one of us have relationship by virtue of our humanity. We are, we are of the... the uh, human race. We, have, we relate to people and have relationship. So you have relationship by virtue of humanity, but you have fellowship by virtue of intimacy. And that is a choice you make. It is a choice that is birthed out of vulnerability, out of honesty and transparency and, and key trust. And so this spirit of antichrist departs from fellowship, causes you to not be vulnerable, to not trust, to not be honest, to not be open. This is a work of this false spirit, a spirit of error. First John chapter 2 continues, verse 19. They, these, these antichrists, these, anti, these spirit of falsehood and error, they went out from us, but they didn't really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going actually showed that they never belonged in the first place. The point here that John is making is that a person can belong to the local church, check this out, but not belong to the true spiritual church of God. 
So when you see the church in the New Testament, as, it, as, it, as it's, we read it and it's talked about, there's two things it's relating to. It's the local church that every believer should be and must be as part of our discipleship journey and community, a part of a local community of faith. But it also is used in the tense of the global church, that there is the spiritual church, the, the, the people of God. So you can, here's what John is saying about this. You can belong to a church and still not belong to God's spiritual family. You can come to church and not be changed. But nobody can meet Jesus and stay the same. Okay? So how do we, how do we discern to see this spirit of falsehood, of error, and of antichrist? Well, the first thing you will see is this operation, how it operates, it wants to separate from fellowship. Okay? And then number two, we, we need to see that it, they, it seeks to deny the faith. The spirit of Antichrist denies the faith. This is the most obvious and probably recognizable operation of the spirit of Antichrist. It's the one we probably think of the most. Is Christ merely you know, a good example, a good man, a wonderful teacher, or is he God in the flesh? Okay, False Christians in John's day... Why he was writing was these false teachers, a big reason. He wanted to be, bring assurance of salvation, but there was a false teaching. There was two schools of thought of this false teaching in John's day. The first school of thought was, was like, they used these special words that, to describe their experience. They, 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 they would use the word knowledge and anointing or an unction. These false teachers said, we have a knowledge that you don't have yet. It's a special knowledge of heaven. We've got special knowledge and a special anointing or a special unction. So we're illuminated. We're living at a higher level than you guys are, are living at. And, and you, need, you need some of this. Look what he says here in, in, in verse 20 now through 25. He says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. This is not an anointing that is false, that comes from darkness, that comes from falsehood. This is an anointing that comes from the kingdom of God. This is anointing of truth. It comes from the Holy One. And all of you know the truth. And I don't write to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it and because no lie can come from the kingdom of heaven. No lie can come from truth. Who is the liar then? It is whoever denies that Jesus, Christ, Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. You cannot claim we have relationship with God or the Father, yet deny the Son. To deny the Son is to deny the Father also. As for you, verse 24, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. We see this word show up in this section a lot. Continue. Remain. The word is abide in a lot of your translations. This abide in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son, and in the Father, and this is what he's promised to us, eternal life. This is the faith we have, the faith the apostle John and the rest of the apostles passed on to the church and to the disciples, but the spirit of the Antichrist denies the faith. Notice the, the faith, because the spirit of the Antichrist will demonstrate faith, but not the faith. What's, what, what, what's, what's the difference there? It's not the faith that's grounded in the truth that sets free. Okay, they claim to have light, special revelation or illumination, but it lacks truth that originates from the kingdom of heaven, which leads to this third mark of the spirit of Antichrist, and that is they deceive the faithful. See, if false teachers were content to enjoy themselves in their own meetings, it would be bad enough, but the tragedy is they seek to lead others astray from the truth and into falsehood. Look at verse 26. He says, I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. Isn't it interesting that the spirit of, of Antichrist rarely tries to lead lost sinners to their false faith? Instead, what they do is, is they spend all their time and energy trying to convert true professing followers of Jesus to follow falsehood. Have you ever thought about that? Why is it that their target is on true believers and not converting people who are lost? This is an attack of the enemy. This is an attack. This word leads you astray. Some of your translations use the word seduce. It's the same word that is used by the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Look at it. He says, the Spirit says that in the latter times, again, same, same, same time, last hour, latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving or seducing is the word spirits. 
that we had faith, but we were led astray by deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Some translations say doctrines taught by demons. That there'll be falsehood that we receive and agree with that will lead us astray and take us away from truth. Satan is called the father of lies in John chapter 8. The devil's agenda is to lead followers of Jesus away by falsehood. He wants to lead you away through deception. He wants to lead you astray through the doctrines of demons. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 says, the apostle Paul now writing to the church at Corinth. He says, but I'm afraid that just as Eve was seduced, he used the same word, deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be seduced and led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preach, it is not that. It is anti-love. It is anti-forgiveness. It is anti-reconciliation. It's a different Jesus. You receive a different spirit. from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted. And then he says this, and you're putting up with it so easily. You're, like, you, 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 you're just receiving it. Look, you shouldn't accept everything a person tells you just because they say they believe the Bible, just because they say they're a pastor or, 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 or a Christian or an apostle. It's, it is possible to twist the bible and make it mean whatever you want out of context see satan is not an originator he is a counterfeit that's how he operates he imitates the work of god for instance satan has counterfeit ministers who preach a counterfeit gospel who produce counterfeit christians who depend on counterfeit righteousness see remember the the parable of the tares in matthew chapter 13 in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus tells this parable of the tares where Jesus and Satan both are depicted as sowers of seed. Jesus, it says, Jesus sows the seed, good seed, that actually um, produces children of God. But Satan sows false seed that produces what Jesus called children of the wicked one. And the two plants, the, while growing together, they look so much alike, so much so that the servants couldn't even distinguish until it bared fruit. See, Satan's chief strategy in this stage, this church age that we're living in, is to plant counterfeit seed, to plant falsehood in lies. Wherever Christ is planting truth, he plants falsehood. And it's important, it's critical to be able to detect the counterfeit and separate the teachings from Christ from the teachings of Antichrist. The, the, what comes from the spirit of truth and what comes from the spirit of error. This is why we need to know the word of God for ourselves. This is why you need to be able to wield what, what Ephesians 6 says, the sword of the spirit that is profitable, not just for teaching, 2 Timothy 3, 16 says, but for correction and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We need to know our word, but check this out. It's not just knowing the word. It's not where the power, discernment, and anointing comes from. Because there are professors and even people that have the spirit of Antichrist that know the word better than you. John says it's not actually through the word, it's through, look at verse 27, it's through the anointing that you receive through the Holy Spirit. Those who have this anointing are led by the spirit of truth. Look what he says, as for you, the anointing you receive from him remains. He, again, that word, same word, abides in you. You do not need anyone to teach you. Now he's not contradicting the other writings that, that actually affirm teachers in the body of Christ and the gift of teaching the body of Christ, he's not contradicting that. What he's saying is that you, you don't just receive any teaching because you, you have an anointing yourself with the Holy Spirit and you better go back to the word of God yourself and check your anointing and compare it to their anointing to discern the spirits to see if they are of God. Okay, so here he says, you got an anointing. Don't just, you, you don't need anyone no to teach you. He's not discounting teachers. He's saying, you better check the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Check the anointing. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, and it's not counterfeit, just as he has taught you, abide, remain in him. So John, John begins this section with giving us some clarity what the spirit of truth, the spirit of error, the spirit of antichrist looks like. 
and what, these, what those marks are, but then he starts to change some gears, and he gives us the four marks of the child of God. Again, these are contrasts. John is drawing the line. It's the test. He's saying, this is how you know, testing the spirit you're operating by, the spirit that people are coming and bringing to you, what they're teaching to you. There is the spirit of Antichrist and error, and there's the spirit of Christ, the children who are born of God. There's four marks he gives us to know if you're a child of God. Number one, he says the child of God will have confidence in his coming. We have confidence. We don't cower. We are confident. We don't, we're not afraid of his coming. We are waiting in anticipation of his coming. Verse 28 and 29, he says this, and now, dear children, continue, there's that word again, abide in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him in his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. As we abide in him. You know what the word abide means? Abide means this. We know God. We love God. We obey God. That's what it means to abide. When we abide in him, it means we know God. We love God. We obey God. When we say we have confidence in his coming, that word says when he appears. You go, well, is he, do you think he's coming back? Absolutely. Jesus is coming back for his church. Well, when is he coming back, though, people ask. If he's, if he's coming back in 15 years, man, I will quit my job. I'll be really good for 15 years. I think I could do it. You know, but so just try to, but what if it's 100 years? What if it's after your lifetime? See, Jesus leaves ambiguity in when he's coming back, but here's why. When you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. See, when that happens, when Jesus, when Jesus does come back and he is coming back for his church, we will, we will all people stand before the great white throne judgment seat of Christ. I've taught about this before, but this is the first place. This is where Jesus actually separates the wheats and the tares, where he separates the, those, the, the, the fruit. Oh, what, what birth, man? Those who are children of God and children of the devil. He separates them. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I do not know you. And those who are his, who are born of him, who are part of the true spiritual church of God, come on in to the master's happiness. And then we stand for, there's, a, there's, there's another judgment for those who are in Christ called the judgment seat of Christ. And that word judgment confuses a lot of people because sometimes we think, oh, we're going to be, we're going to be, ju-. no, let me, let me set you at ease here because you need this to have this confidence. There will be no highlight reel of your sin or your mistakes in the kingdom of God. There will be no record of wrong. It is canceled and erased by the blood of Jesus Christ. The judgment seat of Christ, you will not have on display any shame or regret or pain or sin. It is canceled in a race. See, this is what actually causes us to have confidence in his coming because it is not where I will be judged like you're thinking, judge. This is where I will be rewarded for the life that I have lived in my body and on earth. I receive the rewards due me. Not only does it give me confidence in his coming, but it helps me live appropriately. That I'm not putting my eggs in the basket of this earth trying to get my fulfillment and my rewards through my, my relationships or my job or my experiences and pleasures. No, I know I got a reward coming to me that's better than this world. And I wait in confidence for that coming. We wait eagerly, not ashamed of what we shall receive. See, there's, there's two different types of people in this room. One type of people in this room, when the fuel gauge reaches like E, you're like, I got more time. You know what I mean? There's some of you like, and there's the new car that even, the new cars, it, it even counts down the miles, right? It's all like ticking down from 20 down to zero. Some of you are on zero today. Like you're in, you drove here and it got to zero. Are you on, come on, who are you on E or zero? Where are you at here? Come on, yeah, yeah, God bless you. May you find a gas station in Jesus' name, <laughs> guide you and lead you. Because some of us have been in the passenger seat with you guys and, and it's scary. We're like, we're like, hey, I don't know if you see, maybe we should pull over. Here's one, here's one. And, and you're like, it's a Honda. What's this, what does this mean? Don't know how to receive that. I guess built different. Wait a second. So the confidence that some of you have with driving on E is so inspiring. But here's what I want to say to you. If we are looking to the return of Christ, counting down the days, here's what you need to know. We're living on zero. We're at zero. The gauge is zero, which means we don't know how long till we got till it's like ka 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 
Because I promise you, it will not be a cacat, cacat, oh, push me to the corner, help me, help me. No, no, no. The trumpet will blast. And immediately the dead in Christ will be risen first. And those who are here in Christ will be snatched up and caught up with him. Somebody get excited about the return of Jesus today. This is, this is the confidence that children of God have that he is coming. Come on. This is con- Somebody say, stay ready. stay ready. Okay, here we go. The second, the second sign or mark that we are children of God is that we have confirmation as his child that there is I am confirmed that I'm his that that I'm a son of God I'm 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 a you're a daughter of the king first John chapter 3 now let's go into first John chapter 3 verse 1 he says see what great love the father has lavished on us that we should be called children of of God. This is how we can see it. This is, I know I'm a child of God. See what great love that God has bestowed. Some of your translations say, lavish. He's poured out his love. I know because of his love that I've experienced, I am a child of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that they didn't know him in the first place. Dear friends, Now we are children of God. And I love John's humility here. He says, and what we will be has not yet been made known. Like when he comes back and we are caught up with him and transformed, it's not fully revealed what we shall be. But he says, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. We're going to take on the nature of the resurrected king. For we shall see him as he is. And then he goes back to verse 3 about this hope and all who have this hope. In him, purify themselves just as he is pure. Listen, this is what he means. Those who have that confident hope in his coming, that's actually what keeps us pure. That anticipation of future glorification is what causes me to live in purity now. Are you guys seeing this, you guys? See, we use this language all the time like we. We are you know, he says we're children of God, but we use we like, in a, like with your football teams. You ever use we when you're watching games and stuff like that, and baseball? Like, hey, man, we lost. You know what I mean? We could have done We could have had them. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, we won the Super Bowl or something like that. You know, I just like, dude, who's we? I think if the players were like hearing you talk like that, they'd be like, you didn't do nothing. Shut up. You know what I mean? <laughs> you weren't on the field. You were not on the field here. But we use this we language, and I love what John says. What great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And then he says, and that is what? We are. See, we're not the fans of God. We're the family of God. And, and we weren't always part of his family, were we? We weren't always. We weren't born into the family. You know, Jesus used this language in John's gospel when talking to Nicodemus about what it meant to be a follower of him, a true disciple of the kingdom of God. And he tells them, you must be born again. You remember? He tells, and Nicodemus is like, what do you mean born again? You're crazy. Can a man go back into a mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus is like, no, 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 you're crazy. This, I'm not talking that. I'm talking that those are born of the Spirit of God, a new birth. See, we all share a physical birth date, but do we share a spiritual birth date when you gave your life to Jesus Christ? Let me tell you something. Serving God apart from being born again is the most impossible thing you will attempt to do in your life. It can't be done. I love it in Romans, the Apostle Paul, when writing the, the letter to the Romans, he used the word for being born again as adopted adopted god has adopted and he uses it you know lengthfully in in the book of romans and i love that because check this out the roman law in rome according to roman law you could actually disown a child you could disown your child you cut them off from inheritance you can just you can totally remove them but check this out you could never disown an adopted child and here's why because you picked him you chose here's what God is saying. God has adopted you. God picked you. He chose you. And while we were yet sinners in the middle of our mess and our disgust and our shame and guilt, right there God said, I want you. I pick you. I choose you. You are mine and you are forever my child. God has adopted you. Isn't it amazing the extravagant love that we have experienced and received confirms I am a child of God. This is, this is what the mark of a child of God, that we have confirmation that we are his. Number three, we have conviction toward his commands. 
there's an inner conviction toward the will of God, toward the commands of God. Let's pick it up in verse 8. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is that. It's acting like there ain't no law. It's acting like God don't have a standard for you or a will for you. It's, a, it's lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Verse 6. No one who lives in him makes a habit of or keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or no. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray with any other teaching than this gospel. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil. They're, they're working from the wrong spirit. Because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's works. Okay, so, so remember I was saying there was false teachers and there was two different schools of thoughts that, that this is why. Let me kind of interpret this passage correctly for you guys. There were two separate schools of thoughts of the false teachers in John's time. The first school of thought was, was this, that in order to be accepted and loved by God, you had to be perfect. Can you imagine living under that? Like the shame and the guilt and then the, the byproduct of that would be the masks that are worn and the pretending and the you know, phony self-righteousness that would come out of that. I don't know if you know this or not. Nobody is perfect in this room. Nobody is. We all fall short. I had a pastor tell me one time while I was, teach I was in a Bible school class, he literally told me, I haven't sinned in 25 years. I didn't know what to do with that. I was like, oh my. Maybe, I'm like, maybe this dude's a hermit. He just comes out to teach this class and he goes back to a hole or something like that. But here's what I'll say. Even there, your thoughts can lead you astray. The motives and intentions of your heart. Jesus tells us that, that if you lusted or hate in your heart, it's the same sin that commits the action of adultery or murder. Which is why, remember when we read in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, where John tells us that if you say that you are without sin, you're a liar. Nobody is, is sinless except King Jesus. So when John says he came to take away our sins, he's recognizing that we're all sinful in need of a Savior. But watch this. The other school of thought, this other false teaching was, well, since Jesus died for our sin, you can live however you want to live. And the Apostle John says, well, if that's the case, you can be a lip professor without being a heart possessor. You can claim to walk in the light and claim to walk in love, but if you're not walking in the truth, then you got a different spirit. God is love. God is love, and I'm illuminated, and you need to, no, 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 no. If you don't have truth, then you're, walk, you're working and walking from a different spirit. You can say you have a relationship with Jesus, but your fruit or lack thereof is an indicator that you don't know God. That's what he's saying here. Because if the idea is how much can I get away with under the banner of grace, the apostle John is saying you're being led astray. But Jason, the world is evil. I mean, the devil is after me. What am I supposed to do? That's why verse 8, look what it says. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Because someone in the room may be thinking, well, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't make you do it. He gave you the opportunity. He didn't make you do anything. But Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, which means the devil has no authority over you. Which means you can look temptation in the face and say, Jesus is better. Oh, no, 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 no. This, what I have received from him is better than what you got from me, devil. No, no, no. What I have in truth is better than what you are presented to me in falsehood. See, if a, if a pig and a sheep end up in a mud pit, one of them goes, I love it here. And the other one goes, I wasn't made for this. You picking up what I'm putting down, you guys? What's up? Born in the mud, the muck and the mire, transformed and born again, I listen to the shepherd's voice. When you love the mud and you want to stay in the mud, the word of God says that is of the devil. Don't be deceived. Fourth mark of a child of God, that we are compelled by the spirit. That there is there is something operating from within me 
that is causing me, that is compelling me, that is moving me toward God's kingdom, towards his righteousness, towards his truth. I'm compelled by something inside of me, the Holy Spirit. Look what it says in verse 9. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because, why, John? Because what? Because they're really strong. Because you know a lot of the word. Because you just, man, you learned a lot. Man, you know better now. You know better now. No, 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 that's not. Because God's seed remains in them. Well, what's the seed? It's the Holy Spirit. The seed of God. The seal of the promise. Not a force. Not an it. Not karma. Karma, the Holy Spirit of God. And where the Spirit of God is, there is freedom. They cannot go on sinning. Remember, not sinless, just sinning less. Come on, somebody. Because they have been born of God, verse 10, this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does what is right, anyone who does not do, sorry, what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or their sister. See, see here, please hear this right, what we're, what we're studying here. I don't seek to be godly, righteous, or holy to get God's approval, to get God's acceptance. No, no, no. I'm already accepted. I'm already loved. He chose me. He's already picked me. And in fact, I'm already righteous in Christ. I, I'm already holy in Christ. So check this out. Please hear this. I don't pursue righteousness for righteousness sake. I don't pursue holiness for holiness sake, please hear, not out of context, please hear, I pursue Jesus in righteousness. I pursue Jesus in holiness. It's my pursuit of God that I am running after holiness. I want to be holy as he is holy. Not so that I can be holy, so that I can be like him. Come on, are you seeing this? This is, this is how we know, he says, this is how you know who the spirit of the Antichrist and the spirit of God, who's got the spirit of truth and who's got the spirit of error. The evidence, John says, manifests itself in certain ways. He ends it with, it's the way you treat people, Do you, the way you love them. Let me give you one more verse, not in your notes. Write it down, Ezekiel 36, 26, and then we're going to pray. Ezekiel 36, 26, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It's a, it's a prophetic letter, the, pro, the prophet Ezekiel. God declaring, he's actually declaring something that is accessible to the church. This was declared then in the Old Testament, but it's accessible now to the church. Look what he says. God says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. That we would be compelled, not by sheer force, will, energy, trying harder. This is not the gospel. The gospel is this, by what Jesus has accomplished for you, he can put inside of you a new heart and a new spirit to change you from the inside out and even compel you towards his will. This is the gospel. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.